morning. Um, he is very well known in our community. And uh, this is apropos to the previous talk. Um, I'm going to connect his audio. I'm going to connect his video. Oops. I need the adapter for the video. One second. have Jordan Mechner live with us today. Do we have sound? Yeah. Okay. Well, I saw everybody once. So, uh, cool. so uh, is it true that the talk that uh, came just before was about making Karateka run in two player mode? That's amazing. Well, I'm really glad to be talking to you guys. It's, uh, it's kind of good timing because uh, I just started this kind of odd little project. Uh, you know, I kept journals while I was making my games on the Apple II 30, 35 years ago. And um, I'm actually digging into my archives, which are at the Strong Museum of Play in New York, looking for visuals to support an illustrated edition of those journals. Um, this, is, uh, this is kind of like the the text, mostly text version that's, uh, you know, that I put online a few years ago. So Stripe Press is interested in doing, you know, doing it as a real book. So it's been kind of a walk down memory lane. I've got this, uh, I've been looking through my hard drive of, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff that I just had in boxes in my garage for decades and I've never really looked at, you know, and so now I'm pulling it out, going through them. And uh, I think I'm, I found some stuff that I think Probably very few people outside of the people in this room, you know, will be interested in or appreciate. But it's stuff that hasn't been seen at least in, in a long time. So I thought I would uh, share it with you. Um, I'm going to try screen sharing here. See if uh, give me a sign if this works. Okay, so uh, this was my Bible, you know, when I was about 20 years old. Uh, it was an article in Micro Magazine that explained what all the memory locations in the Apple II were used for. And there's, a, it's probably too blurry to see, but at least you can see how dog-eared this, uh, uh, this, this article was. I, I carried around literally for 10 years. Uh, while making Karateka and Prince of Persia. This is the thing that told me which page zero locations I could use, you know, and which ones were dangerous. And this is, uh, this is what the code looked like at the time. Uh, I'm a little rusty on the 6502 assembly language, but I do notice that this is written in the mini assembler, which is, uh, did, you guys see a show of hands of how many people here in this room have used, have done programming at some point using the mini assembler? Wow. This is a special gathering indeed. Yeah, so uh, obviously, it, you know, it's a matter of this, uh, you know, we didn't have variable names. I had to just enter it directly into the, into the mini assembler and 
some in some cases just go in and change the hex codes to edit the code. Um, so backing up, this was you know I started with the Apple II when I was in high school and then in college, and uh, my first ambitious project you know after I'd kind of figured out how to program in BASIC and the basics of assembly language and was starting to work in high-res graphics was I, I wanted to do a I wanted to reverse engineer a clone of the arcade game Asteroids. So the most, uh, you know, what, what I thought was the best Apple II game at this time was uh, Apple Invader, which I had on cassette. And it was a real, uh, every, everybody here uh, play, play that? A lot of people play Apple Invaders. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it amazed me because it was the only Apple game that seemed identical to the arcade version. You know, it, it didn't look like a cheap reverse engineered uh, copy. It actually seemed like whoever had made it had, uh, you know, must have had access to the to the actual arcade game or, or something. Maybe, maybe there's maybe one of you actually knows more about the history of that than I do. But just as a as a kid playing this game, I was super impressed, and I thought, okay, if somebody did that for Space Invaders, I'd like to do it for uh, what was by then. You know, we're talking. The, by now we're 1980. The most popular uh, arcade game was Asteroids. So I went to the arcade with some graph paper and uh, yeah, and I, I did my best to copy the shape of the rocks that was on the screen because I didn't want to just be like any random rock shapes. I really wanted it to look like the arcade game. And I was thinking, yeah, you know, in, in high school, if, if I can do that, you know, that's going to be sort of my ticket into the video game industry. You know, that this will be something that people will want to play. So here's the page where, I, you know, I did the shapes for the the rotating ship. Now the thing is, of course, the arcade game of Asteroids used vector graphics, which I didn't have. So it's maybe not the most ideal fit to the Apple's capabilities, but I did my best. You know, the small and the medium sized rocks. And those are the shapes for the uh, the ship when it explodes. You know, the little vectors break up. So, so the actual discs of the the asteroids, you know, the the last version that I got working, is in is in the Strong's collection. So it'd be interesting to play that, um, see how it holds up. But I actually finished the game and got it working, and uh, found a publisher who was willing to publish it, Hayden Book Company. Uh, publishers of Sargon, the strongest uh, Apple II chess program at that time. But unfortunately, uh, soon after we signed the contract, you know, my first real publishing contract, the uh, uh, Atari sent letters to the top publishers saying basically, game over. You can't rip off our arcade games and publish your own uh, reverse engineered clones of them anymore. So uh, Asteroids, Although it was finished, was never published. This was a, yeah, this was a blow. But I went on, and the next, uh, uh, the next program that I set out to write. This is now 1982. I'm a freshman in college. Is a game that was like Asteroids, but uh, different enough that Atari's lawyers wouldn't have a problem with it. And here's uh, here's some of my the first sketches for this. This is the font that I uh, laboriously copied the font that was used in arcade machines at that time. I don't know why, you know, it's, it was important to me to get the font down like to the pixel so that it would look just like a clean up game, but, but I did and I was very proud of that. Uh, and here's some of the code for uh, Deathbound as, as the game was original, uh, was eventually titled. And it was kind of like a uh, mix between asteroids and pool. You know, you had a spaceship, you would move it around, and instead of shooting at uh, space rocks, you were shooting at bouncing colored billiard balls that would bounce off the edges of the screen instead of passing through. And uh, uh, if you can see closely enough on the screen, you can see that this is a huge technological advance. I'm now using the mini assembler. Uh, I'm using uh, the SC assembler, which has, you know, variable names and so forth. So this is sort of proper ass assembler code at this point. Um, 
the SC assembler was kind of my first professional tool. And uh, one of the other things I found in the archive here was the manual for the SC assembler. Anyone recognize that? I mean, the, seeing this, uh, this was like Proust's Ma Madeline for me, you know, that like that light blue cover just brought it all back. This is uh, 3.2, this is before we upgraded to DOS 3.3. This is the 1979 version. Um, and uh, I, I just stopped on this page at the appendix because uh, this was a list of the books that were available at that time on how to program the 6502 and how to understand the Apple. And I was, uh, you know, obviously this is you know, not having the internet and not really having any friends in New York where I lived who knew about this stuff. All, all of these resources were really precious. So it's kind of having to figure out, you know, reverse engineer uh, the stuff that, you know, the people who are writing and programming published games already knew. So this brings me to 1982. And once again, Death Bounce, uh, despite the high hopes that I had for it, did not get published. I sent it to Broderbund Software, my favorite publisher. And Doug Carlston, the president of the company, responded that it seemed well programmed, the animation was smooth, but the industry had kind of moved on and that their best selling game at the time was Choplifter. Uh, I, I assume everyone in the room knows Choplifter. I, 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 I didn't at this time. I actually thought he said shoplifter. Uh, I imagined a game where you were going around stealing stuff you know, from store shelves. But uh, uh, but Doug was kind enough to send me a copy of the game, along with a joystick, a TG joystick to play it, because this was the first game, as far as I knew, that actually required a joystick, which I didn't have. You couldn't play it with the game paddles or the keyboard. And uh, you know, shoplifter blew me away, uh, not just with the you know, the animation, the smoothness, the physics behind the helicopters, if they game I played until then, it had uh, 64 lives of hostages. And if you saved all 64, that was a perfect score and it was the end. And if they were all either rescued or lost, it was still the end, not game over, the end. That was very powerful to me, that little difference that here was a game that had a human connection. You know, the little uh, hostages waved to you. They wanted to be rescued. so. This kind of made me think, wow, what have I been doing for the last four years? I've been trying to copy arcade games when here we have this personal computer, you know, we have it in our house. We can, you know, when we buy a game on a disc, we can, we own it. There's no reason to try to, to follow a game design model that's made to make us put in quarters. You know, we, we can actually have a finite experience that gives, you know, gives satisfaction that's, uh, you know, it's sort of a different medium. It's a different form than the coin-op game. So having seen Choplifter, I set aside everything I've been doing. I forgot about Death Bounce and I started making a new game, which uh, here, I, I found some of the early sketches and this is stuff that I hadn't seen in so long. Uh, is that showing up there? Yeah. So, so th these are my early sketches for Karateka. And, uh, you know, my reference, I was looking at a book of, you know, how to do karate, you know, photographs of Karatekas and, you know, various moves. And I was, you know, this is sort of my drawing ability at the time. I copied the stances. And, uh, and so I, I started putting these into the computer as a, you know, I mean, one of the models was a swashbuckler, you know, a game uh, sort of a sword fighting game. Uh, do you all remember Swashbuckler? Anybody play that? Yeah, it's. I mean, that had large characters on the screen, and you know, it's sort of a pirate theme. So that really impressed me. So I thought if I could do characters that big but with fluid animation, you know, that would be that would be cool. That would be engaging. But the problem that I had when I uh, when I started uh, trying to create these animations, you know, as you saw from this graph graph paper sketches is that it just didn't look good at all. It looked choppy. It didn't, uh, didn't fit the image that I had in my head. 
the fact is I didn't know how to do animation. I wasn't a trained animator. I could appreciate good animation. You know, I loved Disney films and, uh, you know, Ralph Bakshi was, uh, was around, but uh, I just wasn't at that level of skill. So, so I, I tried something which actually, it's, I, I found out later, it's something that uh, Ralph Bakshi and the early Disney animators had actually done. They just didn't advertise it. They'd filmed actors doing the moves that they wanted to animate. And then they used uh, that film as reference, but they went beyond using it as reference. They actually, in some cases, traced the frames uh, by it's called rotoscoping. And uh, so that's what I did. I, uh, I filmed on Super 8 film. Uh, here, let's get back to the screen sharing. Yeah, that's, that's tracing of the first uh, rotoscope frame of Karateka. It's uh, my karate teacher. I filmed on Super 8 film, projected the film onto a moviola, you know, editing tool, which had a, it had a crank which you could turn and stop on, on a specific frame. And I traced it with tracing paper with a pencil. There's the next frame. And the next. Let's see. Uh, it's interesting looking at it now because I, I made little notes. This note says that the... Uh, the belt swings. And that here, there's the regular stance. Yeah, you know, I, I, I found where the center was. Then I noted that when he pulls back his arm, the belt moves back. And then when he punches, the belt moves forward. So uh, it was, you know, obviously there was no digitized, you know, there was no video in on the Apple II. It was, it was a matter of like tracing these outlines and then kind of painstakingly pixel by pixel using uh, something called the Versa Writer which Roberta Williams had uh, actually used to do the graphics for the first Sierra games, but which uh, used the two potentiometers of the game paddles as a kind of a pantograph so that you could trace a hand-drawn image like this one. And it would kind of give you a rough jittery version of that on the screen, which I would then clean up using uh, uh, pixel editing tools that I had, but which I also found in the archives, but we only have half an hour, so I, I won't get into the, uh, you know, the reverse, the, the version of Photoshop that I had to try to build in, in 1980. It had a limited feature set, but it was, it was good enough to create these shapes and, uh, and get them into the Apple II and, and then to alternate them, create the illusion of movement. So that was the Rotoscope 1.0, and that was Karateka. And I worked on that game for a few years. Uh, I'm just going to skip forward now. 